morning, Heather from Finer Details. I'm here with Rosemary Watkins, who is a psychotherapist. And Rosemary is going to be um, answering some questions that we come up with during our course of day-to-day -day organising and decluttering with clients. So um, thank you for your time this morning, Rosemary. You're very welcome, Heather. It's a pleasure. Um, what are some of the emotional challenges that people experience when they're surrounded by clutter? Yes, the emotional challenges can be many and varied because um, sometimes people can um, feel quite overwhelmed by the amount of clutter and not know where to begin. They can feel um, guilty for having that, that sense of clutter in their home, especially if they've come under criticism from spouses or partners or family members, um, they can feel really burdened by that and that uh, in itself that emotional component can become like a, a fullness of clutter within as well for them. And um, yeah, the guilt, shame can be there, the embarrassment, um, they're probably some of the key uh, ones. Sometimes there's a sort of um, attachment or connection to it too, they bring a sense of security or safety comfort in having things around them, especially if they're, if they're linked into it in an identity or says something about themselves. But, uh, for many people, and certainly um, people that I've worked with, the families where clutter has come up, they don't always come into therapy looking to deal with their clutter, but it can emerge during the process of, say, a couple relationship work, and, uh, and then uh, those more deeper emotional aspects of them surface. For either one or both. Um, generally it's just one partner has the clutter and the other one is not. Sometimes there's some, um, you know, maybe an unconscious almost attraction to the one um, that will be tidier and neater in the home environment and the one that is cl has clutter um, is like the opposite attract kind of thing. Okay, okay so it's fairly uncommon for mm. both parties in a couple to be Clutterers. Certainly, the ones that I've experienced it generally tends to be one, yeah, okay. rather, one rather than both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why do you feel some people need to collect excess? Like, what, what's the um, rationale that you would see behind that? Yeah, that, again, that's a really, um, really interesting question. And when um, even thinking of those two words, the collect um, excess or you know, collect clutter, and like some people um, collect as well and are collectors, mm -hmm. but there's again a difference. I think it was uh, Michael Kyrgios and I forget his colleague's name, Durham, I think something like that, I can look that up for you. Uh, but they did some work on comparing that, the, the kind of collectors and the difference between collectors and clutterers. And collectors like generally would have things very organized and they're uh, much, um, they don't take up space in the home in the way clutter does. Okay. Um, they have space, but they have like a designated space poten potentially. So, uh, but, but then coming back to your point on collecting clutter <laughs> or collecting the stuff, um, definitely um, I think people tend to be drawn to it as a, um, not even, so very largely unconscious, I guess I'd like to say that first. It's largely an unconscious process that people um, end up with clutter in their lives. Many times it can be literally a busyness and a time poorness that leads to that for many people. They just can't um, get to tidy their desks or their um, kitchen benches or you know that sort of thing. Or put things down when they walk in the door. They're busy and then straight away attending to children and uh, and so on. That it can move forward like that. Uh, but then their personality style and whatever is underneath that would be linking to that will determine whether they come back and sort all that out even if they stay up to midnight or whether they don't mind looking at that there for a few days and but then it can hit a point where they become quite overwhelmed and distressed by it also. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, the recent um, the recent royal wedding springs to mind where they um, did uh, shoots to homes in the UK and some people would collect um, the endless amount of royal memorabilia mm -hmm. but to me um, obviously personal opinion but because it filled their house Although it was a collection, it also was cluttered. Oh, right, yes. So, what's your take on those two? Yeah, because um, it's a collection, but it's cluttered. Yep. To me. <laughs> yeah, it's a great example, actually. Yeah, because lots of the royal, there's so many of uh, those little um, knickknacks. Yeah, knickknacks, <laughs> trinkets that people love to collect and, and have. Um, I guess the 
uh, depending on what attachment they get to it, it's like they can feel a connection to somebody through that. Um, and often you'll find loss and grief. Um, people will hold on to things from uh, a person who a relative was no longer around or has died, then they can often say, you know, I feel close to my mom, or I feel I close to my dad while I have that um, his jacket there or his pipe or whatever it might yeah. be. So they can really uh, feel that connection through it, and there is a, another level of work that might be needed around that in terms of processing it mm -hmm. for people in the process of releasing the, the stuff as well. Uh, but yeah, so some people will get an identity or some source of comfort from it that helps them with it, with the royal wedding, in some attachment, some connection, some little piece of, of uh, the, the lovely young couple that they want in their home. Um, my own mum had this uh, tea caddy of the Queen and, <laughs> and Prince Philip for a wedding and we had that in our house for was all my life growing up. Um, people do collect things as a momentum or a souvenir, but if they collect lots of it and it's taken up space in the house, then I think it is important that people begin to look to see what, how much of this do I need or what's the impact on me and what is it that I'm gaining from having them to do that exploring which can lead to some freedom to choose whether they want to hold on to and how much of it they want to hold on to. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what are the benefits of tackling emotional burdens? Yeah, well, as a psychotherapist I see tremendous benefits in, in tackling emotional burdens. I guess they're like any burden really. Once they're a burden, they're heavy, isn't they? You know, yeah. It's not good to carry and uh, certainly they... Um, Clutter really is a burden too for people in their home, particularly when it gets um, to that overwhelming stage. Um, they, it's not just tidied up on the weekend and then everything's fine again. This, when clutter becomes a problem for people, it's sort of ongoing and there's no time when it seems to get resolved. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, when they might need some professional help, uh, both with the help with the organizing and tackling the clutter also then with the emotional side of what might be happening underneath that uh, because the overwhelm can lead to almost like a paralysis can lead to a, a restriction even in the beginning because um, it's like they're, when they want to start it's too hard to start so they don't know where to start and so then they don't do anything yeah and, and that can you know have echoes in their emotional world that happens in other areas of their life as well so they might be say having a emotional uh, burden where they're um, not wanting to look at it or fear of feeling a feeling um, because to, they're fearful that if they go too close to that feeling they, they become overwhelmed by it. Okay. Or if they cry they'll never stop. Those sorts of things can be uh, behind it. So it definitely there is the potential in releasing that or working with that is that in our society emotions are there to be felt and experienced we pretty well do everything except do that with them. And uh, we're taught to let our um, cognitive function take over more. And to, that's sort of like the, the valued aspect of us. And the emotional side is not. Even back as early as Plato days, he used to talk about the, the emotions and the intellect being like two horses on the chariot, where the emotional one um, was the one that really needed taming and reining, whereas the intellectual one was the easy one to <laughs> let lead the carriage. <laughs> and I guess today in our society, those ripples still stand and people fear their emotions and their feelings and do everything except process and their feeling. And so there's definitely a lot of benefit from it because it can free their lives up uh, enormously, actually, and help them become more integrated where the, the heart and the mind can be linked together. So the intellect and the emotion can live together alongside each other. Many of our clients will say that they feel a weight has been lifted when they yeah, remove the clutter. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for that. Some great insights, and um, we'll certainly be able to um, use those for our clients and ourselves. So, thank you.